Good morning, guys. Let's worship together.
worship with us today. Uh, any of you guys on spring break yet? Anybody? Yes, I miss spring break. I'm kind of jealous. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that up here, but I'm kind of jealous. Uh, also, the green is great, but I know Alex tells us to tell, you, tell each other Jesus loves you all the time, but a few of you are going to get pinched today. Just saying. Anyway, we're going to sing Open Up the Heavens next, and uh, join us, lift your hands, worship, close your eyes, whatever you need to do personally to find that spirit of worship and, and, and join us in that. God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who, whose walk is blameless. Je 
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so Have a seat. <laughs> it is working. And you can pray with me. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for your love and we thank you for this morning as we have time to just be in your presence and learn from you, Lord. And we just thank you for today. Um, amen. Good morning. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm here to give you some announcements this morning on this microphone. Not on that microphone, sorry. 
Okay. Um, we have connection cards. Um, please fill those out and put those in the offering plate. Um, if you have offering, um, you can put that. You can put that either in the offering plate. I'm sorry. You can put the connection cards and offering either in the offering plate or in the black boxes at the back um, of the gym. <clears throat> and um, we just really thank you for your for generous giving. It allows us to fulfill our mission at the branches of connecting to God and growing in Christ and loving others. Um, if, if this is your first time to the branches, we're so excited to have you here, um, and we hope you feel welcome, and please especially make sure that you fill out the connection card so that we can connect with you. <clears throat> um, we have a few announcements for this upcoming next few weeks. Um, the first one is that on Wednesday, this Wednesday at the Rec Center um, at 6.30, we'll just meet right here at the Rec Center, we're going to do a prayer walk. And if you've never done a prayer walk before, it's, um, you are welcome to come, and it, it won't be scary or overwhelming. It's just walking and praying. Um, so you can come and pray with us. And if you're a woman, you can then head on over um, to Iguanas for Senoritas and Margaritas after that. Also, if you're a woman, you are welcome. <laughs> you are welcome um, to um, sign up for the women's retreat. Um, I and some others have been planning um, this women's retreat. It's called Wonderfully Made, and it will be on April 19th and 20th. And there is maybe yeah, there's a QR code on the screen, and there's also a QR code on the back. And if you have any questions about it, please ask. Um, we'd just love to have you come. And if you have friends that don't go to the branches or family that doesn't go to the branches, they are also welcome to come. Um, and then the final announcement is Holy Week. Um, obviously, that is a significant week for us. Um, so during the week, um, Thursday will be Abide, um, which is our monthly prayer service. Um, we'll be taking communion during that service. And then Friday, we have the Good Friday service um, at Talon Stream Park. Sunday morning, we'll have a sunrise service at 8 o'clock, and then also an Easter celebration service at 10 o'clock. And then after that will be our Easter egg hunt extravaganza. So we hope that you can, can be with us on Holy Week and, and be sure to invite, um, just be prayerfully considering who you could invite um, and to come to Easter and participate um, in that celebration. Um, and then, is that it? Am I done? Sorry. I don't usually do announcements. Do you want me to read the scripture? Okay. Okay. Please stand as you, I know what I'm doing. Please stand as you read the scripture. Um, okay. Matthew 5, verses 48 to four, 43 to 48. No, that's not right. All right, Alex will read the scripture. We're going to watch the video and said, you can have a seat. All right. Hey, welcome. Oh, I just moved everything. Man, we're like up here. 
You would have thought this Sunday would be daylight savings. I have no idea. I also, my name is Alex Hershey. I'm the pastor here. So glad that you all are here. It is a great day to be able to gather. Uh, it is awesome uh, to see all the nice shades of green. That is very good. Very good. Also, uh, when you ask your sister to do announcements, you just, we have this, what like, that's my sister. Katie is up here. And so there's this part of my brain that I'm like, just understand what's in my brain, sister. Anyway, but it's all good. Uh, would you really quick turn to those around you and tell them that Jesus loves you? Can you do that for me? Perfect. Great. Oh, my goodness. Well, awesome. Would you stand right now, too, as we read the scripture for today? which is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, and we are going to be looking at the story of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it, he answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Would you pray with me? Oh, God, thank you so much for bringing us here in this day. Thank you so much for the grace that you... Show to us time and time again and the mercy that you allow for our hearts to receive. And Lord, we just pray right now that the words that we are about to receive are not mine but are yours. That our hearts are not the same but they be transformed by your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you may have a seat. Well, we are in a season of March here in Indiana, which we love March in Indiana. Uh, High school basketball is in full tilt. Um, and uh, state finals are getting figured out there. But also, today is Selection Sunday. So a week from now, all of our brackets will be busted. Let's just, uh, all of our brackets will be busted. Uh, Rosa, you don't have your brackets busted. You, you're like, you'll just be talking about it all the time. For the rest of us, we'll just be talking about how we need to mow our yards to change the subject, right? So, but that's all happening right now. And I was thinking about it. You know, we've been talking about the underdog this, uh, this month. And, uh, and we see throughout Scripture, time and time again, that God talks about and uses underdogs all the time. And we also see, as we've seen in the last two weeks, that to be an underdog is hard. It's hard. It's unexpected. It's, it's not something that we would necessarily want to have happen to us. We like to be the, the knight in shining armor. But so often it is hard to be the one that is overlooked and misunderstood. And yet, time and time again, we see God doing this. But I was looking at it, and I wanted to, first I wanted to recap some of highlights of March Madness for us all. So for some of you, you'll be happy to see things. So, ooh, there you go. No one has any, uh, we're all green here. So, like, it doesn't matter. We don't know who is who. But we remember this. This was just a few years ago, 1987, the last banner that was hung. And so, I, I believe. And so, anyway, Steve Alford, I believe he is older now. And so anyway, and then there's this guy. Remember this for you guys? Remember that? The big dog? Oh, man. What a, what a team there, led by Gene Cady. Uh, for those of you who are new to Indiana, sorry. Anyway, but like we're just talking about this. But then this is the shot that could have changed everything in the world. I still believe if this shot would have gone in, the world would have just, Jesus would have just descended and everything, it would have all been like Duke loses, Butler wins. The underdog has arrived, you know. But that, oh, remember that? I remember. How many of you thought that shot was going in? 
Like, oh my gosh. Oh, so close. And then because it's me uh, and I get to have control of the slides, oh, let's go, Illinois. Yeah, there's Sean. Woohoo. Let's go. Yes, and remember this amazing team. And if the refs, I will just say this, if you, and I know none of you remember this, maybe, but in, in, when Illinois played North Carolina in a championship game, I was still in seminary. And uh, all I know, the next day I was pouting because they lost. But then I went into my ethics class, my ethics class, and my ethics professor, who had no buy in in any of the teams, he said, Last night, Illinois got robbed. And I was like, Amen, that's right. That's an ethics teacher saying that. That makes sense. So anyway, but D. Brown, Luther Head, and Darren Williams, three of the greatest ever at the University of Illinois. But we love these underdog stories. Uh, and children, you can go look up all that later. That's a history lesson for you. Uh, but hopefully we have new history uh, coming, coming up here soon for uh, basketball. But the thing is, is that what we continue to see, though, in all of those teams, in all of that, it is hard to be the underdog. It is hard to be the unexpected. And I believe in our lives we can, we can desperately want that, but also try to avoid it. Try to avoid it. And so what I mean in that, we can desperately want to be used by God, but we also avoid it too. Because we know some things that come along with it can be hard. And in the story that we see today, we see an expert of the law approaching Jesus, in essence saying, how can we make it, are you just trying to make this easy? Or you're trying to make this a little bit more difficult. And the way that Jesus responds in such beautiful fashion is just something that we can, we can try to wrap our heads around and try to understand. But let's first understand it. First thing that we see is that this expert of the law, a lawyer, approaches Jesus and he tries to trick him, right? He tries to trick him and he asks the question, what does it mean to have eternal life? And Jesus, in classic Jesus' way, he goes and he, he quotes the Old Testament, right? And we talked about this a little bit last week about, he says, well, you need to love God and you need to love your neighbor, right? We talked about this last week. And, and it was one of these things where the expert of the law, he understood and he shook his head and he's like, yes, I get this. And so Jesus, he passes that first test for this guy. But then just like any good lawyer, he has a follow-up question, right? The follow-up question comes and the lawyer asks, but who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And now, this is where we get the famous parable, the Good Samaritan parable. In response to this simple question, who is my neighbor? And so what we see, as we look at the cast that is about to be introduced to us in this parable, the first person is the man on the side of the road. He was on his way from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets robbed, right? He gets robbed and beaten, and he's left for dead. He's left for dead on the side of the road. That's the first character that we see. And then the next characters that we see, the first one is this, of the, of the people walking by, is the priest, right? This would be someone probably similar to me, right? This is fantastic. Oh, makes me looking good. But this is a religious acting person. And he sees someone on the side of the street half dead. And what does he choose to do? Does he go up and help this person? No. In fact, he actually goes on the other side of the road and he continues to walk right by him. This would be someone who talks the talk but cannot walk the walk. It's true. It's true. And this is what I would say today in comparison would be those of that would we would just simply brand it the cultural Christians of our day. They can look the part but none of their actions are actually lining up with Jesus, right? This is something that we are seeing that is happening more and more in our current Western culture, right? So this is what takes place, that, and the priest would have been Jewish. The next character that we see that comes up along this person, like, right? It's almost like this little skit that Jesus is telling us. It's this parable, and all of a sudden, then the Levite comes, and the Levite is the expert of the law. So this would have been hitting really close to the guy that Jesus was talking to. He was pretty much saying, Oh, you're a lawyer? Well, here's a Levite. So he's hitting close. And what was this guy doing? He well, does the same exact, thing, same exact thing. Avoidance, though, right? And this is the person that knows the law, but ignores the law. I know all these teachings. I know what sounds good, but I'm going to ignore it, or the rules don't apply to me, right? None of us have ever done this, right? 
well, I can justify ignoring this person on the side of the road. I can justify not doing exactly what Jesus is teaching me, right? And so really quickly, in my mind, I can pinpoint all the other people that can fall into the category of the priest and the Levi, and I'm really good at avoiding to see any of those tendencies in my life. <laughs> but as we look at this Good Samaritan story, we see this, and then, and then it becomes a little bit interesting. Because at this point, if you know the historical context, which we can look at, is that there, there's the uncleanliness of it all, and there's like race stuff that's going on, but more, and, and probably there is the race stuff going on, but I want you to hear this. More than the race stuff that's going on, we need to understand this as grace stuff that's taking place, all right? Let's not get lost in it. Let's look at it and see the grace stuff that goes on. Because in the final person, the Samaritan, the Samaritan comes along. Now, the reality is that everyone so far in this, in this story has been Jewish, right? They've been a, a Jewish person. That's very common. But the Samaritan and the Jewish person should never get along. There's a history there. There's still a history there. But there's a history in this. And Jesus starts to hammer it down, right? He starts to look at it, and he wants them to see this. And he says that, you know, the, the history is not good. When the Samaritans were, were getting, they got taken over, and then the Samaritans would get taken, it was just back and forth. They were just trying to make each other mad and angry at each other. There was a rift between them. It, it, it just name-calling, half Gentiles, half Jewish people, and, and all about all of these things, like, it's not new in Harry Potter, right? You know, like half muggles and muggles and wizards and this. That's just fictional. This is real. And so, like, but like, but that is what's taking place in this moment. And so, it is unheard of. It's not just unheard. It is unheard of. Someone who is Jewish and Samaritan and good standing, to go up and interact. But why? But why would a Samaritan? come by someone who he wished was dead and was almost dead and choose to help. This is the trick in the parable. This is the understanding that Jesus is trying to hammer home. Who is my neighbor? There's this Levite guy, and there's this priest, and then there's this Samaritan. The person that you can't stand. The person in your mind who is the underdog by all things, and yet this is the person who comes in and helps. And we see the generosity flow from him. We see it all, right? He bandages him. He takes him to the inn. He lets him ride his donkey. He does all of these things. He pours oil and wine, and then he says, hey, I'm going to be gone, but when I come back, I'll make sure that all the debt is covered, right? It's the above and beyond that is just unheard of, right? But yet this underdog person, the Samaritan, chooses to do it. You know, we can look at it, and, and, and a lot of people like, right, under, like this story. This is a famous story, right? There's hospitals called, like, the Good Samaritan. There's nonprofits, like the Samaritan. And it's all in good case, but they look at it, and they just say, this is a compassion story. And so we're going to be compassionate people. And, and don't get me wrong, we are a compassionate people. Like most things that Jesus says, at the surface it's powerful, but then if we go a little bit deeper, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. So on the surface we see compassion, and so people get excited. They might follow Jesus. They might not follow Jesus. They don't know. And they're just like, let's call this Good Samaritan. Let's do the Good Samaritan work, and we'll just make sure that everyone's okay. A little, put a little Band-Aid on it and move on. Jesus is going deeper here. It's much deeper. You know, being a good Samaritan means helping someone who might, who might hate you, right? You can put that up there. Being a good Samaritan means helping someone who might hate you and praying for someone who dislikes you. Well, Jesus, let's, let's, I'll just go put the Band-Aid on. <laughs> you know, like, let's just stick at that, like the surface moment of that. But remember, this is not a race thing. This is a grace thing. This is the power of Jesus' grace. And he says this, being a good Samaritan means helping someone who might hate you and praying for someone who dislikes you. That sounds fun. But this is the unexpected helper, 
Jesus is the unexpected helper. He's the, uh, he's the assumed enemy that turns into the hero, right? He's the assumed enemy that turns into the hero. We see then that grace comes from an unexpected, unexpected place to an unexpected person. You know, each character in this is an enemy of someone, right? Even within the Jewish community, like the priests and the Levites and, and all of the, they're all enemies, right? You're making me unclean. You're making me clean. I debate you. I do blah, 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 blah. So we're seeing this passage all of a sudden get a little bit crazy, right? Like, all right, enemies. Happy St. Patrick's Day. At least no Irish things have enemies. Anyway, no, but anyway, sorry, that's our name. But like, this is the thing. Like, we see, like, this passage becomes deeper because it's a passage that we see in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says that we need to love our enemy. And I want to look at this passage really quick in the context of understanding the Good Samaritan. Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This passage reminds us, right, that one, we probably do have enemies in life. Jesus has pointed it out. And he's simply saying, make sure that you love your enemies. And then it says some other things. We just read it. But then it gets to this last line that really hit me this week. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Meaning that probably this moment in all of our lives that can make us stumble and trip to ever being that that perfect love to those around us is that we stumble and trip over that we all have enemies. We all have someone that causes our heart to turn to stone. And we would rather just walk by them and step over them and leave them for dead. That's light, but it's true. There are those in our lives that can hurt us. You know, the thing is, is that in the story, like, like we can be like, I can't believe they did that. If I would ever see someone on the side of the road... I would pull over, I'd do the exact same thing, I'd probably even put them at a nicer hotel, right? We think this. But this is the scenario that sometimes we don't talk about. That road was very dangerous, right? That road was very, very dangerous. It was a tricky road. Robbers, murderers, all of it was happening all the time, and it was like you put your life on the line getting on that road to go anywhere. And some of y'all, like when you go on vacation, right, you're like, just lock the doors, quick, let's get, we gotta get back out here. You know, and even when you go into the city sometimes, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I took this turn. This is where that one thing happened. How did I end up on the east side? Ah, everybody, duck in the car. Why am I driving down 40 right now? This is weird. Anyway, so we have these, don't tell me, don't tell me that in this moment you can't relate to probably the priest and the Levite. If I would help them, I will put myself in danger. I'll put myself in danger. And I don't want to do that. God surely wouldn't want that to happen to me. Right? So this is hard. Self-protection, fear, and apathy are not excuses for passing by and become, can also become indicators that reveal our hearts. Oof. Sometimes it's not even just helping the person on the side of the road. It's caring for the coworker. This facing hardship. The family member who's deconstructing their faith right now. Instead of talking to them, we avoid them. But we want to protect ourselves. We have fear. We have apathy. And really, it just begins to reveal our heart. Ignoring our neighbors, right? Who is our neighbor? Ignoring our neighbors reveals that we do have areas in our lives where we're not loving. It's hard. Because we all have neighbors. We live in suburbia. That is like a guarantee. You can actually look through windows in some of our houses and see other, your neighbors eating dinner. We're close. We're compact. We're right there. We go to the bus stops every week. We talk. 
It's hard. Jesus is trying in this moment to pull people together to understand in this parable what it looks like to have a mature love for all people. That's what he's, that's what he's going for here. He wants you to have a mature love for all of his people. The Gospel of Luke is one of the, the best themes of the Gospel is Luke is just this constant reminder that Jesus' love is for everyone. And that also in the Gospel of Luke that he's saying to the disciples and trying to tell to us still to this day that you are the instruments of bringing God's love to everyone, neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. All of it is all for everyone. And this is the thing. Through God's grace, we are forgiven of our apathy or our anger toward our enemies. That's the truth. Through God's grace it is. This grace then allows for us to extend grace and be an instrument of reconciliation. This passage is about grace. This passage is about forgiveness. At the end of it, at the end of this passage, right, what do I do then? Who's my neighbor? Da, 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 da. Good Samaritan. What do I do? Mercy. So, go and share this mercy. That's what he tells this expert on the law who first came so concerned about eternal life. Then who's my neighbor? Then Jesus sends him and says, go be a forgiving person. This came on later in the sermon. I thought my sermon was done. I thought it was going to end. And then I realized, like, I woke up the next morning and realized that this message needed to all be about forgiveness. Ugh. It's so hard. I mean, I accept forgiveness. Like like all stores except major credit cards, I accept forgiveness from everyone. Now, to be someone who needs to forgive, that's a whole other thing. What I have learned, though, is that when you choose to lock in to being unforgiving because someone has harmed you, maybe in a past marriage, maybe in a past friendship, maybe in a past business partner, you said they did something to me that is unforgivable, and so I'm going to allow for that to just never be forgiven in my life, right? What that begins to do is it turns your heart into being something that is supposed to be unlocked by Jesus, right? Unlocked so that every corner of it can be filled with God's grace and love to be extended to others. But instead, what begins to take place is that our heart begins to become a stone. And it becomes cold in one area, but soon enough it becomes apathetic, resentful, hurtful to all those around And so when Jesus is saying this, he's making sure to tell us anger prevents us from being Christ-like. You've got to free free yourself from it. Revenge prevents us from having mercy. To turn your heart away from the shackles of sin and the shackles of anger towards others, we begin to have to step into a life of living into the grace and extending forgiveness. And it's something that I think has to become a practice. It's, it's, like a, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's like a thing. It's just like going and training your muscles, you know, or wandering on a track. It's something that has to continue to just be extended to those around us. Like, right? And sometimes I think we can start with the little things. Like, you know, I, I forgive Mike Woodson for just casting this season aside, apparently. No, I'm just trying to, just for you IU fans, I don't know. Anyway, but like it's the little things sometimes, you know? Like I forgive, I forgive this person of this. Or I forgive the person for cutting me off. Or I forgive the coworker who like, like didn't, did something that drove me crazy. But then it gets, gets bigger because I believe it is like a muscle that like as we learn to forgive, we can get better at forgiving a little bit bigger things and the bigger things, it sometimes can be hard to jump from the little to the huge things. I think God is teaching us and wanting us to be someone who is able to have the courage and the patience of letting the Lord work in us so that we can process forgiveness in our lives. Allow for that forgiveness nature in our lives to grow stronger and stronger so that we can be a people who are filled with grace and extend mercy, so that we can allow for our hearts 
not to have sections of stone, but that our hearts can be filled with love and grace for those around us. I think sometimes, what does this look like when we have that unwillingness to forgive? Like, it's one of those mindsets, well, they need to forgive me first before I can forgive them. Oh, I'm right there. Or maybe it is that, like, for some of us, and I, I'm just being serious here, is that we're okay just being angry. I mean, actually just feel good about it. We like to entertain that anger. Some of us, we want to withhold that forgiveness because it actually builds up our ego. I am better than you. You wronged me. And I'm going to just hold on to this. Some of us can be scared because we might not know what that forgiveness will look like. Do I really want to be reconciled with this person? Do I really want them to know after all of these decades that I'm still thinking about them, that I'm actually giving them the light of day when I wake up and I'm angry? And then just the honest, some of us would just choose to rather just to stay in that place of not moving at all. But God has more for us, right? God wants us to be free from that. God wants us to be set free from that. So when we notice that we are facing anger issues and resentment, right? Like, oh, oh, when we notice it. Like, uh, the first is that we have to name the wound, right? Name the wound. I'm not saying you have to name it to someone else, but just name it. Say it out loud. I was harmed by so-and-so in middle school. I don't know. I was harmed by so-and-so when I started in my work profession. Like I was, and name it. Name it. I think also we got to be aware of triggers. Triggers are important. They send us places that are not good. Those triggers are everywhere now. It's not even just driving by stuff. You can have your phone and it can just trigger something, right? Be aware of this. I think then you just need to name the person, right? That needs to be forgiven. Jesus says pray for people by their name. Say it. Say it out loud. But then be someone who is prayerfully ready to let it go. To let it go. Being an underdog, like I said earlier, is hard, right? It is hard. We all want to champion it on, but it's hard. The highest seed ever to win the NCAA tournament was in the 80s. Villanova, ugh, Big East, whatever. No, anyway. An eight seed, one in the, in the 80s. Only five 11 seeds have ever made it to the final four. And I believe, oh, what was it? Like maybe a few other three seeds higher than around uh, eight or through 11 made it to the championship game. But only one high seed. The highest seed, eight, is ever won. Being an underdog is hard. And a lot of times, we don't get to lift up the worldly trophy at the end. But yet the world needs us as underdogs. A people who can normalize forgiving those who harm us and hurt us. Because as we tie this in, we are two weeks from Easter. I am so excited for Easter. I love Easter. It's the, it's the gospel. It's like Jesus, salvation. But as we look at this passage, right, and Jesus is giving this parable, how is he not being like, hey, you all that are listening to this, remember, like we're talking about a guy who's dead, almost dead on the side of the road. That's you all, right? I'm, I'm just envisioning that Jesus got really southern in that moment. That's you all, right? Like we were all almost dead. We were lost in our sin. We were on the road thinking we were fine, and then all of a sudden something knocked us over and we're on the side of the road. And we thought we didn't have anything. We thought we were broken. There is no way that we can ever live beyond this moment. And yet then the good Samaritan, Jesus, comes in. The person we didn't expect. 
the son of Mary, steps in and he says, you are not dead, but you are alive. Where you thought you were going to be lost and broken, come and I have shelter for you. I have food. I will allow for all your hurts and your pains to be healed because I see you and I love you. Jesus has given us ultimate victory because he has allowed for our hurts and our healings to be healed. Today, how do we begin that forgiveness momentum in our life? It's first by saying, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for bringing me in when I thought I was out. Thank you for not forgetting me when I thought I could just sit in my hurt and my worry, but now you have brought me in. You've cared for me. You've put oil and wine upon me, and you lift me up, and you say that I'm not forgotten. This forgiveness helps our hearts turn away from stone and turn into instruments of God's mercy, grace, and love because we choose to forgive instead of hang on. We let go and we give over to God to be everything that he has designed us to become. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that in these moments, we are not a forgotten people. And Lord, we pray right now that we can become a forgetting, forgiving people. And I just want to pause right here. Lord, there are those of us here who know we still need to forgive someone that we have never forgiven. Someone who's hurt us maybe in the last week, or maybe someone who has hurt us years, decades ago. Just right now, let's just forgive. Then all we simply have to say is, Lord, I forgive this person. I'm tired of still being angry. I'm tired of being apathetic. I'm tired of trying to figure out how to send revenge to this person. And so, Lord, I instead humbly say, I forgive them. I forgive them. Amen. Here at the branches, as we end the service, we take communion because Jesus commanded us to. He said, do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. Jesus, as he approached the cross, had a meal with the 12 disciples, with his friends, and he simply just started telling them something that was, was strange, but yet they'd become used to it. Jesus' language. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then he passed the cup and he said, this is my blood spilled for you and the forgiveness of your sins. So that you can be made right. So that you can be whole. So that you can be holy as I am holy. Will you choose to take? And so everyone here who believes and confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord is welcome to take communion. And how we take communion here is that uh, as the band plays the final song, we come forward, we're handed the cup, and we come back to our seats. And then after we're done, finish, after we finish the song, we take communion together. But the reason we come forward is just that moment where we can come forward and we can release those things that keep us from knowing God more. Whatever it is that we have elevated to be more important than God, the sin. And it can be good things, it can be good things of the world, but we want to release them. We want to be made new. So as you come forward, just feel that, that release of letting go and allowing for God to fill our hearts up. Would you come and receive the wonderful grace of Jesus this morning?
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are How great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us how he loves us all. Yeah, he is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affection for me and oh how he loves us all oh how he loves us how he loves us all so deep and so wide that we can't escape it. And so allow for our hearts to just experience His grace and step into it. It's a peace that we can never explain, so let us receive it. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood that Jesus shed was transforming. It was something that had never happened before, where people, once they sinned, they thought they had to live with it until the day they died that it would linger in their lives forever. But this blood, this juice that we remembered, Christ's blood, is a blood that sets us free because it transforms us.
As you drink it, don't let any sin steal this transforming power. Blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Oh. It's the joy of the Lord when we receive His meal. That's what it is. It's the joy of the Lord. And so in this moment where we gather and we now are getting ready to leave, tearing down chairs, always fun stuff here, as we go and get our brackets, get all set up and think we've figured it out and we'll do all the great stuff. We have a week ahead of us where some of us, we know we got big projects, we got all this stuff happen. Whatever it may be, but in this moment right here, we are a forgiven people, right? Yes, we are forgiven. And we have the joy of the Lord in our life. And so let us make sure we not forget this. That as we leave this place, we begin to be the light of Christ to all those around us. So come Holy Spirit, fill us up. Allow the Spirit to fill you up so that as we leave this place, we continue to be Christ's church to all those around us. Let Him know that you are ready to be used in His hands. Allow for forgiveness to flow from your lips and allow for transformation to happen in your heart. Let us go with Christ this week, sharing his love to those around us. Amen. Awesome. So glad that